so we don't have them available so you know we'll just have to work with what we got I want to talk to you first of all about what a stronghold is and how we get a stronghold a stronghold is exactly what it says it is it just means that the area of oppression has a strong hold in that area that's all it is this isn't a hard thing how do we get a stronghold number one Exodus 20 verse 5 says that the sins of the forefathers travel to the third and fourth generation and here we're talking about sins of uh, adultery sins of fornication people that are God haters those types of things that that all travels down generationally the second way is through crisis for whatever reason if there is a crisis in the life especially the life of a child say they lose a parent at a very early age you know three four or five up to ten years old that leaves a real void in that child's life and if not careful it will open up the door to heaviness where grieving takes place the third way is Joshua 24 15 says choose you this day whom you will serve and every day we make choices some days we make good ones and some days we make lousy ones if you make that lousy choice enough you're gonna open up the door to a stronghold and I don't want to waste any more time with covering any of this because um, we just have too much other ground to cover I just kind of wanted you to know where I stand with that when I'm dealing with children I always tell them as we go into a ministry session because you don't want to talk about demonic things you don't want to talk about stronghold things you don't want to mention the devil a whole lot because most children do not have a foundation on the word enough they have huge imaginations and if all they're going to hear is devil 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 it won't be very long until you're going to have children that see a little bitty God and a great big devil so we have to be very careful in dealing in this area with children now you may have a whole different group of kids and they may you know do whatever but I'm just telling you that most kids don't have that much of a foundation within them to be able to handle a lot of talk about demons devils and that kind of thing because see their imagination is going to create some and you're going to spend all your time putting out little fires of this that and the other and you're going to miss the time that God could be exalted so you know you got to keep a balance with that when I'm dealing with children one of the things I tell them and I deal with them strictly as a prayer issue in other words I sit down if they're small enough I hold them on my lap and we pray and I go through each area that needs to be gone through in that way and I tell them what I'm going to do is pull little hooks out like fish hooks because those little hooks are holding them back and each time I go through one of the manifestations of the stronghold we pull a little hook out and we pull a little hook out until we get done and we say see you're not caught up in that anymore now you're free and when you deal with it in areas like that and you can use that any way you want to it helps them to understand it gets them participating in what's going on but in a manner that's a godly manner and in a manner that doesn't leave them frightened or scared or thinking that they're different and we don't ever want to do anything with a child in front of other children because children can be snots even in the church they say cruel things they tease and we don't ever want a child to ever feel that they've been made different in any way because that brings wounds and we're not here to bring wounds we're here to heal wounds so some of the things I want to talk about this morning now that we're through all that stuff is some of the issues that are really prevalent today with kids one of them being Harry Potter, another one Pokemon. And I know you'll say, well, why are you going to talk about those with us? Aren't we got church kids. <laughs> For some reason, even in the church, we don't get the big picture. We don't understand that the enemy has an assignment. And he is here to take our children I mean he comes but to steal kill and destroy that's for all of us 
but he really is after this generation of, of children and of young people. And you want me to tell you why? I've, I've prayed about this and I can guarantee you that this is my thinking on why the enemy is so out there. It's because, see, we keep waiting. We, we all are, are aware that we're in the last days. We all keep waiting for God to come and lay on us that end time anointing, you know, that's going to do all this great stuff. Well, guess what? If, we'll get, if we get any of it, it'll be by the grace of God. But that end time anointing, because this is that generation of children and young people that the end time anointing has already been deposited into. It's already been deposited in, into them. Just waiting for the appropriate time for it to be released. And boy, if you're an intercessor and you don't feel that, then we need to talk. Jesus. That's why the enemy has so come against this generation of children and young people. Because he wants to kill that off and prevent that from being released because of what it's going to do. It's going to put an end to his works. I think that's one of the reasons why the attack has come down so far. I mean, to the kids and the forms of things like this. When you start reading Harry Potter books and you may think, well, what's wrong with that? Well, let me tell you what is, what's wrong with all of that. Is number one, it opens up the door to things like familiar spirit, divination, that includes things like sorcery, witchcraft, all of those issues that the enemy will use against that child. See, once that door gets opened up, then they become really interested in that stuff and they'll just go after it seeking it everywhere they can I was in one of the the bookstores the other day and there was a lady that came in and she uh, wanted this book and the, the lady said well we have a three-month waiting list on, on that book and every time we get a shipment in the waiting list takes care of uh, the whole shipment and so we keep almost a three four months backlog and when this this lady says well I don't know what I'm going to tell my daughter she says got to have this book she left and I said, well, what book are we talking about? And she gave me the name of this book and I can't remember it right off, but I said, what is that book about? Oh, it's a, a book on basic witchcraft, casting spells, incantations, that type of thing. And she says, oh, it's all the craze for the 11, 12, 13 year olds, especially girls. That doesn't scare you, it should. See, that's what the enemy wants. He wants the door to be opened in these little kids' lives. Move on to Pokemon. I could go into a lot more depth, but we don't have the time, so I'm just touching the surface of these things. Pokemon. I mean, what, what is the name Pokemon? Doesn't it? Pocket Monster. Well, doesn't that tell you something? I am forever, even here at Brownsville, having parents come up going, well, my kids, they're, they're, they're coming out with all this strange stuff. I had this one lady that came up to me, and she says, I've got a problem with my uh, nine-year-old son. He's really into this Pokemon thing. And, and I'm thinking in my mind, and so where are you? And she says, now, now it's so bad that he says that Pokemon's telling him to do things. See, when you think about where Pokemon comes from, from over the Asia countries, they love demons over there. They're good things to them. You know, they make little do what ditties and, you know, if you ever bring a souvenir home from over in, in the Asian countries and you turn them over, there will be a hole in the bottom of them. You know why? Because that's where they put their spirits. And see, they put them there, and then we bring them home and put them in our home. It's because over there, all of that, that is welcome stuff. And here we have our children opened up to it. And my question to this lady is, where's your husband? And you know what I got. Well, where are you? Well, I, I, yeah, for, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. 
Why aren't we investigating? Why is we in church? Why are we not looking at what our kids are looking at? I don't care what name is on it. I don't care if Walt Disney puts it out. Hello. It's full of witchcraft. And all of these kids get involved in it. They get themselves opened up. And I guarantee you it's going to be more, 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 more. More interest in that area, more interest in that area. Mainly because after a while they'll start getting involved in it and they'll begin to see some of the power in it. And unfortunately, then they come to Sunday school and there's not much going on there. And so in that child's little mind of weights and balances, it, hey, I see something happening over here. See, we sell our kids short. They're very smart. And they figure things out real easy. Real easy. One of the things here with deliverance with children, I minister to, to children, yes, but on a very limited basis. This is not the answer for everything and everybody. So I don't want anybody to get that idea. Because children are the way they are because of parents. And if that parent has not done well with this child so far, that tells me that a deliverance session isn't going to change that. And it won't. So unless mom and dad are working and walking where they're supposed to work and walk in the Word, teaching their family, don't bring your kid to me and say they need deliverance because what that tells me is I got a problem in my house and I want you to do something about it and I don't want to be number one responsible and I don't want to do anything and I don't have the tools that it takes to keep anything straight. So unless mom and dad are doing what they're doing, we're not going to do any deliverance because it's not going to work. And you would be bringing more on that child than needs to be bought. This is an answer, but this is not the universal answer because it's not good for everyone. So please keep that in mind. I want to talk to you about generational issues. I hear people say all the time, well, I don't believe in generational curses. I don't believe that things follow down. Well, I'm sorry that, that you don't do that. Because look around. Try and tell the Kennedy family that. Look in your own family. And then tell me you don't believe that things follow down from one generation. Patterns and so forth, they do. For instance, the cycle of abuse. That, by the way, is the number one issue I deal with at Brownsville. Probably 90% of the deliverances I do are women that have been sexually abused as children and they're not being abused by strangers. They're being abused by brothers, uncles, cousins, fathers, stepfathers, stepbrothers. And I'm going to touch on that abuse issue a little bit later. What I want to tell you is that cycle of abuse is an issue that needs to be dealt with generationally because it just the pattern keeps going. Every time I talk to an abuse victim, they'll tell me that their mother was sexually abused or their grandmother, and it just keeps going. God-haters, people that, that have history and generations of, of uh, people that have hated God, there are curses that follow that. The Bible says there is, and it keeps following from one generation to another. That needs to be broken. as well as some practices of the occult. And by that I mean when you've had relatives that have been, that have been involved with things like voodoo and... Uh, see, that's a generational thing. That was part of, a, of people's religion that was brought into this country. Every time I deal with an Afro-American person, I have to deal with juju and voodoo and, and some of those issues because they have come down from one generation to another. Things like sexual issues. Start looking back in your family. And, and this is always a good one, and that's people that have children out of wedlock. You, 
you start looking and it doesn't just happen with one generation. It happened before that. It happened before that. It happened before that. And if you go back in your Bible, I think it's Deuteronomy 22 and 3, if I'm not mistaken. It talks about the bastard curse. It's Deuteronomy 23, 2. And this is what it says. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation. Shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord? And basically what that's saying is if you have a child out of wedlock, it can't come into the temple, wasn't allowed in the temple. And that curse carried ten generations. and we think we don't have problems. We have lots of problems, lots of issues. That needs to be broken because it's just gonna continue. It's almost like the same cycle as the cycle of abuse. It just continues from one generation, every time adding another 10 generations. Sexual perversions, whoredoms, people that have been fornicators, adulterers, idolaters, all of those things go down from one generation to another. I have counseled with people that have been in adultery and not known why. They don't know why. But when you start counseling with them for generations back, they've been in grandparents, great-grandparents, parents have been adulterers. These are issues that need to be dealt with because, see, that comes right on to children. The propensity, and as they get older and start making their choices, believe me, it's easier for them to get involved in these things because the propensity is there. It's been carried down from one generation to another. ADD, very big issue. That opens up that door to deaf and dumb, and I have never seen a more misdiagnosed issue in all my life. There are so many children on Ritalin. Do you know what Ritalin is? It's baby cocaine. When it is ingested in the system and it hits the, the brain, the chemical change that takes place is the same as someone that has just ingested cocaine. And this is what we're giving our children. And because the, the ADD is found in what we call deaf and dumb, that opens up the door to deaf and dumb where we find spiritual blindness, spiritual deafness, which leads to spiritual death. And see, ADD starts something like this. And I don't want to tell you that every person that has been diagnosed with ADD, that it's not justifiable because we have to keep a balance. Some people actually have a problem. Others do not, it's a spiritual issue. It starts out when little Johnny is this big, real little. And you see, he's left with grandma all the time. When revival first broke out, every grandmother in Brownsville was bringing me their grandkids. They need deliverance, I can't get them to mind, I can't get them to listen, I can't get them to do anything. First question, where's mom and dad? Well, dad's over here trying to find himself, and mom's over here trying to find herself, and guess who's got little Johnny? Grandmas were made to spoil grandchildren, not discipline them. And so there's very little of that that usually gets done. And another way of saying ADD, by the way, is DAD. Anyways, we've got little Johnny here, and Johnny is given lots of choices. Johnny, what do you want for lunch today? I want to go to McDonald's. And so everybody drops and takes Johnny to McDonald's. Johnny, where do you want to go on vacation? I want to go to Walt Disney World. It doesn't matter that you've been to Walt Disney World 87 times in the past two years. We stop and we go to Walt Disney World. And it's like Johnny does whatever Johnny wants to do. Johnny doesn't want to take a nap. Well, if Johnny doesn't want to take a nap, he doesn't have to take a nap. 
He can just play and play and play. And he has the rule and the reign of everything. Nobody does anything unless they ask Johnny. And then as time goes by, Johnny gets to be. And we all know what, what happens when Johnny gets to be five. He's going to start school. And so we take little Johnny to school and we introduce him to his teacher. First day of school, the whole day. Johnny, sit down. Johnny, sit down. Johnny, you need to sit down. Johnny, sit down. Next day, same thing, same thing. After a while, Johnny says, I'm Johnny, I'm not sitting down. Do you get it? The only problem is the teacher has 15 Johnnies in the class. And so then the call goes to mom, and mom comes in, and it's, there must be something wrong with this child because he can't focus, he can't stay seated, we can't get him to do his work. You know, I think he has some sort of deficiency. You need to take him to the doctor. And here we start the whole process. The process is, is not Ritalin. It's not ADD. It's a little wooden spoon about this long. And if you don't, if you don't get a grip on it, it's going to be bad. See, when Johnny is small, up until about the age of 10 or 11, you can retrain. You can go back and get the discipline in. You can get the boundaries in. You can do all those things that should have been done that never got done. And Johnny will retrain and be okay. The problem is, who's going to do that? If he has let go, believe me, I have two teenagers, one 14 and one 16, and I'm telling you, you're not going to retrain them at all. Because I've been trying. It doesn't work. You know, they're invincible, nothing's going to happen to them, and mom and dad don't know a whole lot, because we know it all. You're not going to retrain a teenager. And then what happens is that child grows up to be a man and tries to hold a job, and he can't, because he can't stay focused on the work. He doesn't know where his boundaries are, doesn't know what limitations are, and we're going to have a problem. The problem is that there's problems everywhere. And believe me, you can get them off of Ritalin as a teenager, but their body begins to crave that addiction. And the next thing you know, they're going to go from one drug to another drug because the propensity is there for that. Very big issues. It's not a deliverance issue, folks. It really isn't. It's a mom and a dad issue. It's an issue of going in and teaching the child boundaries and limitations. And that's not up to the Sunday school teacher or it's not up to the uh, children's church workers. That has to begin at home. See, everything begins at home. And if it's not done right there, you're not going to get it done right in one hour on Sunday morning. I've had ladies that have called me and they've said, well, we've got these kids in our church that people just drop off. You know, they, we don't even know where they come from. You know, either they get on a bus or somebody just drops them off. And you're always going to have that. Those are what we call liabilities. They're not going to bring anything to your children's ministry. They don't have any money, so they're not going to be dropping dollars in your offering plate. Mom and dad are not going to come in and help you out and support you because God only knows where they are. And for these little kids, the best thing that you can give them is a big hug and as much love. The love of God will do a whole lot. See, I grew up out of that. I was in church since I was four or five years old, but it wasn't because my parents took me. It was because I always found a church and went. And I was always a liability. But bless God, someday I turned into an asset. Only by the grace of God and the people in the church, just like you workers that extended the arm of God with love and helped. So your job is very important, very important. You never know who you have sitting in your little group.
You never know how God's going to use them. And so don't always just pick out the ones that have rich parents that are never going to do something for you that you're going to give a little attention to. Give some to those that have nothing, that come from nowhere. And that hug you give me, give them is probably the only one they're ever going to get because it was for me. So think of how God uses you in such mighty ways. I'm going to move off of that, and I know I'm jumping from one thing to another, but there's just so little time and, and so much I want to cover. The issue of sexual abuse, and I gave you a handout there. This is one of the most hurtful issues for children. If you can deal with these issues as they're small and get the doors shut, it will save them a lot of grief as they get older. And I don't have time to really go through each one of these steps, but I'm going to try. When someone sexually abused, there are four doors that open immediately. The first one is to fear. And I don't have time to touch on each one of these. Now, just because I have these listed here, it doesn't mean that everybody that has these characteristics has been sexually abused. You know that. I'm just telling you, if you have a child that someone has brought to you and you've gone through the proper channel as a, you know, notifying whoever you're supposed to notify and parents want you to minister, these are the areas you'll minister in. One of the biggest issues with fear is intimidation because that's one of the biggest ways the enemy uses. So that will be something you will have to deal with. All of these will play a part, so you'll just have to begin to pull those little hooks out one by one, one by one. I'm going to move from fear over to heaviness. In the, the deliverance manual, we have scripture references for all those. That's, I'm sorry I didn't have time this morning to put all those in, nor did I have room on this piece of paper. So, it, you know, if you're interested in that, I'll be happy to let you use mine to get your references. For heaviness, I mean, it goes everything, everywhere. You'll have broken hearted. You see that child will have a break in their heart. And part of it will be love and part of it will be hate. The part that's love says, I love you because of who you are. The part that's hate says, I hate you because of what you've done to me. It was a, nine times out of ten, an authority figure in their life. And see, from that day forward, Every time that child meets an authority figure, it's okay. Well, if my father or my stepfather abused me, what are you going to do? So there gets to be a real fear of authority and fear of authority figures. Plus the failure of authority figures. I have lots of even little children that say to me, they, they give me this question. Why would God let this happen to me? Why did God do this to me? As I get older, because it's been around for so long, it comes in the form of, don't tell me God's a loving, caring God, because why would he allow this to happen to a small child? See, it's not God's fault. When you go back in the Bible and you study authority, God gave the raising of children to parents. And he says, here's the authority. And so God can't go back and pick that authority up because he gave it. So instead of a hating God, it ends up being a failure of an authority figure. And you can get children to understand that. They can understand that mom and dad just failed and that they'll do better. And unfortunately, they pay the price. Things like rejection. Children become so rejected as having been abused. Most women that I know feel like a piece of dirt. But that's grown up from a small child all the way till today. And it hurts a big part big part. Roots of bitterness, 
Sometimes they're present. The real big issue in this area of heaviness lies with the suppressed emotions. And that's because as a child is sexually molested, there's all these emotions and they don't know what to do with them. They don't know how to deal with them. I mean, how, what do you do? Who do you tell? Sometimes when you tell, they say you lie. That didn't really happen. So what happens is they begin to suppress the emotions. In other words, they turn them off. This is the number one cause for the church being on antidepressants today. I've never seen so many people on antidepressants. And the reason that we're taking antidepressants is because there's all this pain and all this hurt, no way to deal with it. It's been stuffed down for so long. And so as long as we can take some medication to further suppress it, and see, every time the pain comes up, we take something to push it back down. Isn't it just time to deal with it? And as a child, you have to begin to call forth the suppressed emotions the way they have suppressed them down. And because they are children, they, they come back alive real quick because they haven't had years to grow and continue to suppress. And so their emotions will come back alive. Basically, when your emotions are suppressed, you don't love, you don't hate, you don't feel anything. You're, you're just turned off emotionally. I'm going to jump from there over to jealousy real quick. And I am just skimming the surface here. In the area of jealousy, while you may deal in all of these areas, there'll be one very big area, and that's with the anger. As a small child, again, they haven't had years to suppress that anger. It's the same principle as the emotions. They don't know how to deal with the anger, so they press it down. And every now and then it creeps out, and then they press it down, and sometimes it creeps out, and they press it down. And so you just begin to call forth the suppressed anger as a result of sexual abuse, and it'll begin to break in it. And in jealousy, that's the only area I have to deal with. Come over to perversion. And in perversion, there are many things that happen. When people have been sexually abused, they go one way or the other. I mean, there's two ends of the spectrum. They either go off the deep end over here or they go off the deep end over here. Over here, we've got what we call a frigid spirit. And what that says is, I withhold myself. Now, you may be married, you may have children, but you're not giving as God intended. When he made the sexual union, it was a mutual giving. You may go through the motion, but you're not giving. Somebody's just taking all over again. Or you go to this end, which you are off into every sexual perversion you can think of, even down to lesbianism, because you've been so deeply hurt by men that you just say, I'm not going there again and you find yourself in some lesbian relationship. Does that happen? It happens a lot. Again, the child abuse issues, incest, molestation, all of those have to be dealt with. The wounded, sp excuse me, wounded spirit is a big issue for a lot of kids because see, they're, they're so wounded on the inside by what has happened to them. Just big gaping wounds, that's all you can say. And as the years go by, they get bigger and bigger. We deal with them differently, but the wounds are the same. Pornography, we have to deal with pornography with sexual abuse. And the reason for that is because of what's gone in through the eye gate and what's gone in through the ear gate. When you have small children that have been sexually abused, they've seen things they don't understand. Their mind has been opened up to things they don't understand sexually. Their ears have been opened up to sounds that they don't understand. And unfortunately, a lot of people use stuff as they get older. 
when you've been opened up through sexual abuse, sometimes as a child gets to be older, 10, 11, 12, 13, they understand that, hey, I can work this just right and get anything I want. And so we learn to control through sexual abuse. You want a new bike? Just be good to daddy, you'll get a new bike. And believe me, that only gets bigger as they get older. And we're all different and we all handle things different. That's why everybody doesn't handle things the same way where sexual abuse is concerned. It's just that that is an issue I've had to deal with a lot in women. Again, the things that have gone in through the ears and in through the eyes will lead to pornography later if you don't deal with it. Get the door shut in those areas. And then one of the things we have to do is we have to break the soul tie because it has been sexual abuse, just like in people that have had sexual relations uh, outside of marriage or whatever, and there needs to be that soul tie that gets broken, then we break the soul tie. How many of you have heard of soul ties? A lot of you. Well, I won't bore you with it. I'll just give you the, the little bit of it. Matthew 19, 5 through 6 basically says, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. When you choose to become sexually intimate and, and child abuse, you didn't make that choice, but it happened. Two became one. And so when that parting took place, there were fragments that were left there. And that needs to be broken. A lot of times that's associated with the emotions and with the memory recall. That's why they keep remembering over and over and over and over and over again. And so there's a little thing that we go through um, where we just ask in the name of Jesus that these fragments be separated one from another according to Matthew 18 and 18. Then we ask them to tell their spirit to forget the unions. Then we ask them to tell their soul to release their mind of any responsibility for other people. And then we ask them to tell their emotions to let go and forget. And then basically we just take a Bible and just cut the ties. I do this for anyone that has been involved in premarital sex, that's been married before, in adulterous relationships, because the soul tie will be there. And there's always a drawing back to that. And so when you've got children, well, you want to get that broken as soon as possible. And that pretty much is what I wanted to talk to you about today. I have one more thing I wanted to go to. Actually, two more, but I'll cover them quickly. One is the seducing spirit. Mark 13, verse 22, talks about false prophets and false teachers in the last days that will seduce even the very elect. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is because I'm seeing this right now. I am seeing this so big in adults and in children. And it's the way the enemy is bringing things to us, even good things, that is seducing us. And a seduction is nothing more than drawing your affection away. It's what seduction does. And it's, and it's causing us to get over here into things that we don't need to be, even well-meaning things, when we need to be over here. It is very big. I've never seen so much of it. Right now, and I, and I, don't, I hate to go here, but I'm going to. Even with, with the upcoming election, we're seeing such a seduction through the media. I mean, the seducing spirit has a hold of the media along with that end time spirit that wants good to be perceived as evil and evil to be perceived as good. And I mean, it is alive and well and working. It's trying to seduce us away even from our own values, from our own foundation, from the way we really think, off into thinking about, worrying about some other thing over here that, bless God, we may never see. How many of you know time is short? And I'm going to tell you this, God expects 
He expects every one of you to do the right thing. He expects you to do the right thing. And I'm telling you that he is looking to see whether you're going to do the right thing. I just threw that in. One more issue I wanted to talk about, and I really, I have hesitated with this all morning long because I didn't really want to do this. This is a children's conference, but I'm going to be obedient here, so we're going to go there, okay? We've only got a few minutes left. As I go out and do workshops, the Lord has really put the anointing on, on one particular area where he has gone and begun to do a lot of healing in people. And so I'm going to go there this morning. And that means that some of you are going to get something that you didn't think you were going to get today. Isn't that good? But I'm going to have to rely on the Holy Spirit. Several months ago, well, now it's been about a year ago. I lose track of time. How many of you do that? It seems like we're just here, there, and I go so many places, I don't even know where I was last. I was doing a, a woman's conference, and this happened to be just three days after Columbine. And so we were all thinking in our mind, you know, the Columbine shootings, and why, why is this, and why is this coming about? And why are kids killing kids? And just all these things were just rolling through our mind. So I was driving out to Texas, and the whole time it was just really bothering me. And I thought, well, what's the open door for all of this? And it just wouldn't leave me alone. So I got out there, and uh, the first night I did on sexual abuse, and so I got through that and uh, went to the hotel, got back there late, and was looking over my stuff for the next day and I decided to go ahead and get a shower and everything so I could get out the door early the next day. And so while I'm in the shower, I was still, this wouldn't leave me alone and I kept saying, what is the open door for, you know, all these, this murder in schools and kids, you know, killing kids and, I mean, what's the deal? And the Holy Spirit says, well, you're going to be teaching on that tomorrow. And I thought, oh, great. Well, you know, I've got several things I'm going to be teaching on tomorrow. And so I got out of the shower, and I went over, and I got my notes, and I started looking, and I started looking down. And I, one particular thing just kind of jumped up at me. And it was in the area of perversion, and it's called abortion. And I said, oh, great. Because, you know, when you do conferences, they give you so much little time, and you got everything just squeezed into, and I thought I could feel all this change coming, and I said, oh, God, what are we going to do? And so I didn't get any sleep all night long because I didn't know what he wanted done. And I got there the next morning, and I was in the same place. And I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'll do the first session, and then we'll take a little break, and I'll come back and do the second session, and I'm just going to have to let the Holy Ghost move because I don't know what needs to be done. So to make it short, what happened was I got up there and I said, I, you know, I really don't know what the Holy Spirit wants done, but I do know this. I'm just going to start talking, and we're going to let happen whatever happens. And so I began to talk, and I said, you know, I know abortion is a real sensitive issue, that there's so much healing that needs to take place that I just need to go ahead and touch on this. And I said, you know, I've always thought as a Christian, I don't believe in abortion. So basically, I'm let off the hook because I don't believe in abortion. I've never had an abortion, so it doesn't affect me. But I'm having to change my mind. And the reason for that is because the Bible says that, you know, we obey the laws of the land and our laws say what? Our laws say that the right to choose belongs to women. Our laws gave you that right. And with rights come responsibility. So whether I like it or not, I've got some responsibility on my hands. And I said, I think it would be good if we just all came forward 
just as godly women and got on our faces and began to repent and ask God to change the laws of our land so that we don't have to bear the responsibility of something we don't believe in. And so, I mean, like three or 400 women just all came forward. And I'm laying on the platform thinking, oh, Jesus, now what? And the Holy Spirit says, I want you to get up and I want you to go up there and this is what I want you to say. I want you to say these words. Just lead them in a corporate prayer of repentance. And then I want you to say, just as Rachel mourned and lamented for her children. And when I did that, deep mourning and travail began to break out right over here. And it began to sweep. And it swept to right over here. And then here it came again. I mean, deep stuff. And it just swept. But it was stopping right over here. And I looked down, and there was about 50 teenagers that had come and were apart and they were all sitting together so when we knelt down they just got down where they were and they were right over here and the Holy Spirit says now you get up and you go over there and you break death off of that generation because see anybody that's born after 1972 when Roe versus Wade came into effect that death is on them some have death that have followed them out of the womb because their mother has had an abortion prior to their birth so that death follows them right on out. So I did that. And the Holy Spirit says, you're not done. And I thought, well, now what? Because I used to just go out and present this as teaching and cut it off and let it go. And he says, if you'll let me move, I'll move. And so what we're going to do here for the last minute or so If you're in this room, and for whatever reason, you've had an abortion, and you need for God to heal you, and this doesn't just affect women, it affects men, because some men have paid, or they've forced, or they've had women that have made choices that they didn't want made, they suffer too. But if you're in this room, and I can already feel the Holy Spirit working, if you're here and you want God to heal you today, I want you to stand up. I know that this is a conference, and I know I know all that, but if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? And if you don't do it here, where? You think you're going to do this in your prayer closet? Jesus. Come on, there's more. Stand up. Stand up. And while the rest of you pray, I just want you to bow your head for a minute. I'm going to go around and I'm going to lay hands on these people and ask God to touch them. And if you're sitting in the seat and you need to get up, get up. 